Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts. And we have a new co-host, Chris. Chris Rees, of course, is the Deputy Chief Economist. Uh, and uh, we're welcoming Marissa Dinantali uh, as our uh, new co-host. Welcome, Marissa. Thanks, Mark. And, uh, you know, I, I did have some intrepidation uh, about uh, having you be a co-host. Uh, I'm just being honest here. And, uh, you know, my problem, frankly, Marissa, is your salty language. Uh, <laughs> I was a little nervous about it. Right, Chris? Oh, she, she, oh my. She, you know, it's hard to keep her. Uh, it was a one-time incident. One time. We'll is see. Right? Well, okay. we'll see. And we'll it was hardly it that salty. It was hardly that salty. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Well, you, you, well, you're very uh, forgiving, Chris. I mean, yeah. But uh, we're, I'm just we're, excited that she's uh, our co-host. Yeah, we, it's been we, a long we, time we, coming. The only thing that saved it for me was, you know, we we can edit this. We we generally don't. We generally don't edit. Uh, but uh, every once in a while, so uh, I thought we could do that. But uh, Marissa promised me she'd keep it keep it light, keep it keep it clean, keep it clean. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited to be here. So well, thank you. It'll be fun. And you're on the West Coast, so I That's think right. we do. We need. We're recording, recording this a little early for you, aren't we? Or is this? It's seven thirty. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She keeps uh, East Coast time. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I'm used to getting. The other day, we had a four thirty meeting, my time. Okay. So this is this is late in the no, afternoon for me. No big deal for you. <laughs> yeah. No big deal. No big deal. Okay. Very good. And I should say. It's wonderful to have you. I mean, you keep the trains on the tracks here. Uh, you manage the entire global forecast process, which has gotten pretty complex, I'd have to say, over the years. We've got folks all over the planet, and we're doing all kinds of forecasting work now. I think l this week we're doing the NGFS scenarios. Is that that's right? That's right. Climate change scenarios. That's right. Right. So that's the the national greening of the financial system. And those, these are the folks that put together the uh, scenarios that many financial institutions around the globe are using. And we take what they do and we expand what they provide to uh, our broader models and provide all of the variables in our models to our clients. And that's a process, isn't it? Yeah. One that fortunately I don't have to manage, someone else does, but um, other, uh, you know, a whole team of other people in our climate group do it. And, uh, but yeah, our whole research department is involved over 40, 50 people. And it is quite the, uh, the challenge. It's brand new for us, right? It's, it's brand new for pretty much everybody over the past year or two. So we're still figuring out the, the best way to do it and um, provide the most value to our clients. But yeah, we have that. We have many forecasts ongoing, as you know, at the same time simultaneously every month. So it's and, a lot to a, juggle. And a lot of uh, uh, kind of idiosyncratic scenarios, like I, I noticed we're running scenarios, China, Taiwan, U.S. conflict scenarios. Right, uh, right. Uh, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, Bolsonaro, Lula, con uh, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure how we're describing it, but a mess in Br Brazil scenario, you know, kind of thing. So lots of different scenarios. Yeah. We have a guest, um, Mark Obrinsky. Mark is uh, the chief Eco economist at the National Multi-Housing. Uh, is it council? It's the council, right? N National. Uh, it is the council. National Multifamily Housing Council. We oh, National Multifamily. Sorry, National Multifamily Housing Council, uh, NMHC. How, how do you, that's a mouthful. What do you, how do you, what do you say? NMHC or how do you describe it's, what you um, We wish we had a different name, right. but <laughs> changing names is even harder than sticking with National Multifamily Housing Council. So okay. amongst ourselves, we refer to it as the council. The, oh, okay. That, NMHC. That yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. it a lot better. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you are the chief economist of the council. I am indeed. Yeah. And we we have known each other for many years. I dare say decades. I I think. I, um, I, uh, uh, it's a scary thought, Mark. I don't remember exactly when we met, but I think uh, it it's pretty close to the point at which I'm equidistant. That was that point is equidistant from my birth date and today. Yes, right. That's how long I'm ago sure. it was. I know. We, we've been, and I'm sure you 
came to NMHC from Fannie, right? Or was there some some? That's other... correct. But the, walk it walk it back a step. I, yeah. I might have even met you in a job prior to that. I was uh, the deputy chief economist at the old U.S. League of Savings Institutions. Oh, that's right. The, the former that's trade right. association for the saving and loan industry before that industry and that trade association kind of faded away, let's say. What years were those? When you were I was there from 1984 through 1989 oh, uh, or 90. Action-packed yeah. years. Those were action. I got to see a lot then, yes. Right. Um, it, but that was it, actually, that was my introduction to housing economics. I had done nothing in the way of housing prior to that. It got me into housing finance and, and, and the housing industry. And from there, I did move to Fannie Mae, uh, where I was there for about 10, 10 and a half years. And did you know Chris when you were at Fannie? Did you guys overlap? No, we did not overlap. I'm I'm too old to have overlapped with him at Fannie. So, you, Chris, you, you came to Fannie after Mark had already left. That's right. <clears throat> yeah, I, le I left in 2000. In 2000. Oh, so... So the SNL crisis kind of came to a fevered pitch, what, early 90s, wasn't it? So you, you kind of left right before it all fell apart, or was it falling uh, late, apart by late, late, late 80s, actually. So Late 80s, okay. So there's actually a theme here. I, I kind of hate to bring it up, but um, before I was at the U.S. League of Savings Institutions, I was teaching uh, at a mid-sized university, as we like to call it, uh, Bradley University, <laughs> in Peoria, Illinois. Wow. I arrived there in 1979. People told me Peoria is uh, immune to cycles because we have Caterpillar tractor here. Uh, right. Five <laughs> years later, bumper sticker said, last one to leave, please turn the lights out because world economic you know, downturn and Japanese competition crashed Caterpillar too. So, so, so first I crashed Peoria and then left to saving a loan industry. Then that industry fell apart. I moved to Fannie Mae. I got out of Fannie Mae before that was taken over by the government. Oh. And now I'm with the multifamily industry. And we've had a good 22 and a half year run for me. So uh, maybe, my, maybe my bad luck is uh, finally ended. Yeah, that's an ignominious kind of track record there. Uh, yeah, and I, and I said it anyway. I'm just trying to be honest. Yeah. Well, I've, I've got something similar for you. Let me, you know, we play the statistics game. So we're going to play, this isn't the real game, but I'm going to play a little bit of a game kind of in the spirit of uh, your uh, personal history. And let, let me ask, uh, what do these three years have in common? 1929, 1980, and 2008. You guys are economists. I know what the answer is, but. Oh, you do know what the answer is? <clears throat> I think so. Yeah. Go ahead. Far away. I mean, as, aside from recessions, that right. the Phillies were in the World Series. <laughs> they won the World Series. Won the, won the World yeah. Series? Okay. Yeah. In yeah. each of those, in fact, those are the three years that the Phillies or their the athletics, which preceded the Phillies, yep. won the World Series. 1929, 1980, and 2008. And those are also years when, when what? Of course, yes. The world fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. The In economy fell ways. apart. So, yeah. are, so are you rooting for the Phillies then or no? I am. Uh, I am rooting for the Phillies, uh, uh, but I, uh, I'm buckling in at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because if they win this World Series, if history, <laughs> you know, I don't know, causation, correlation, who knows, but, uh, but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so the so the Phillies have a better track record than you, Mark, in terms of uh, predicting. And that's that. a sad state of affairs. Sad, sad state <laughs> of affairs. And I, I say this as someone who lived in Philadelphia for a good eight years and uh, certainly followed and and loved the Phillies back then. Well, so man, who's your you, pick? You, you... Who's your pick? Well, I I don't forecast. I'm going to forecast stuff I know. I'm certainly not going to forecast stuff I don't know. Oh, that's how we differ. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's indeed indeed we for, we'll forecast anything so what are you what are you forecasting chris uh, do i have an option you know yeah you, you have no option yeah. Yeah. there's no option yeah, it's got to no be the option. phillies yeah. all right okay yeah well it's going to be an action-packed weekend mark here in philadelphia we've got a, this is friday got the first game of the world series tonight 
The second game is Saturday night. Of course, we love our Eagles. They're 6-0, and the only undefeated team in the NFL. They play Sunday. Then I, th- I think there's two more World Series games, Monday and Tuesday. So this is going to this is going to be very exhausting for you know watching all these games because uh, these baseball games go on forever. But anyway, uh, well, it's good to have you. And a uh, and um, and uh, we will definitely come back to talk about the multifamily housing market. Uh, a lot going on there, and really critical uh, to the broader economy. Uh, you know, given uh, the housing shortage and also given inflation, because rent growth is a big part of what's going on with regard to inflation. I want to hear your views on that. Uh, but before we go there, uh, let's talk about this past week uh, and all the economic data. Oh, this is a plethora of data, a cornucopia, uh, a feast of economic data. And maybe I'll turn to you, Marissa, and just ask, where, you know, given all the things that came out, GDP, a lot of housing numbers, uh, we got uh, the Employment Cost Index, a read on wages, uh, durable. I mean, trade. I mean, we it was income, like, we, lots of deflator, spending, yeah. lots yeah. of housing data. I Where know do you we want got to start? Which indicator would you start with? Well, let's talk about the ECI, which is the Employment Cost Index. Interesting. You're going to the ECI for Chris. Would you have thought that? Would you have said ECI? Oh yeah, that's fine. You, you would go to the Employment side. Cost Index. Mark, yeah, would you have gone with the that. ECI first? No. So what would you have gone with first? That's well, the policy. most important GDP. one. No, no. Clearly, the uh, the quarterly survey of apartment market oh, conditions. Exactly. <laughs> I forgot about that one. Nice. Yeah, nicely done. How could I forget that one? Was that released today, Mark? It, it was a, released today, as a matter was, of fact. Oh, Boy, okay. what, a, what a great setup, Chris, huh? Isn't this guy good? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we're definitely got to hear about that survey. In fact, I saw you gave me some advanced warning on that. And uh, there's a lot going on there that we need to talk about. Okay, well, let's talk about the ECI, the Employment Cost Index. Fire away, Marissa. It came out this morning. Um, so this is the quarterly survey that shows wage growth. And this is the Fed's preferred measure of wage growth. So this is really what they're keyed in on when they're looking at whether or not inflation is is bleeding into wages and we're creating a wage price spiral. So uh, if you look quarter over quarter, data for the third quarter came out this morning. Total compensation costs for all civilian workers rose 1.2% quarter over quarter in Q3. Year over year, that came out to 5%. These are both down, whether you look quarter over quarter, or year over year, a tenth of a percentage point. So year over year growth in Q2 was 5.1. It ticked down a little bit to 5% in the third quarter. Same with the quarter over quarter number, down a tenth of a percentage point. So it moved in the right direction, right? It's, it's not a huge move. It, it kind of budged down a little bit, but it is cooling. If you take it together with other, some other wage me- measures, another one we look at is the Atlanta Fed wage tracker. Um, that also has been cooling the past couple months. It shows much stronger wage growth than the ECI overall, but it is also moving in the right direction. Average hourly earnings, although I don't really like that measure, that's also cooled in the past couple of months. So it's moving in the right direction. It's not huge. I think in terms of when I look through the whole report, it actually looks a little bit more hopeful than those top line numbers would indicate. So for example, if you just look at workers in the private sector and you look at total compensation quarter over quarter, that went from one and a half percent in the second quarter to 1.1 percent in Q3. And wage growth slowed by about the same amount if you just take out, you know, if you just look at wages and you take out benefits. And then when I look across industries and occupations, there is kind of some broad-based slowdowns across most industries and occupations too. We still see really strong wage growth in the service sector, led by leisure, hospitality, and retail trade. Those are those have strong, very strong wage growth. Construction wage growth is still really strong, but given that's a very interest rate sensitive industry, I would expect that'll cool too. So So it's so it's good. It was kind of in line with expectations, moving in the right direction. But it's not in you know it's not not anything to be dancing in the streets about in terms of signaling much lower inflation. So, so of all the indicators that came out, you picked ECI wage growth because it 
uh, it's a read on what matters in terms of inflation. And right now, inflation is kind of obviously at the, the top of the list of concerns and uh, is driving uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing in terms of interest rates. So we need wage growth to moderate, to be consistent with a moderation in overall inflation and get the Fed ending its rate hike cycle and of, and potentially, hopefully, avoiding a recession. So th th this is that's why you picked this indicator. It's so central to all of what's going on here with inflation and monetary policy. That's right, right. And, and, you're, this, and you're saying, oh, it was okay. Uh, I, I guess one thing is we've been getting all these ugly numbers, and the fact that it wasn't ugly felt – to me, pretty good, right? I mean, I, I go, oh, thank goodness. Right, it wasn't a worse. bad surprise. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't worse than anticipated, yeah, which worse. is yeah. And then <laughs> there are some things in the bowels of the report that give you a sense that things wage growth might be rolling over, starting to moderate. Okay. I think so. I, okay. I agree. I would agree with that characterization. Yeah. Yeah. My my favorite measure in the ECI, and I think this gets to the kind of the uh, gives you the best window into underlying wage dynamics is. Uh, wages and salaries for private industry workers, excluding incentive pay, mm -hmm. uh, one-off pay, bonuses, that kind of thing. I know that's a mouthful, but that kind of gives you a sense of the core underlying uh, wage growth. And that does feel like it's moving in the right direction. It peaked on a quarterly basis, the increase in the first quarter of this year, moderated in the second and moderated again in the third, still mm -hmm. elevated over 5%. But that gave me some solace that you know we're headed in the right direction does that yeah. sound, sound about right okay yeah hey, hey chris anything you want to add to that conversation around the eci does that is that consistent with your uh yeah <clears throat> i think that's about right and i don't think it changes the fed's stance or policy going forward it's kind of in line with the expectations right so it doesn't yeah. doesn't cause them to accelerate or back off on right. rate hikes yeah it's to script <clears throat> right. Right. And the script is we're going to raise rates. The Fed's going to raise rates three quarter of a point when they meet in a week, uh, another half point in December, probably another quarter point in Janu January. I don't know where markets are now, but that feels like at that point they're going to pause and take a look around. Is that what markets are thinking at this point? Yeah, you I know, think that that's fairly right. I think there might be another quarter point in there. Yeah. On the somewhere. Although um, after today, we'll take a look and see what it what it yeah, says. We'll yeah. See. Okay. Okay. So, Chris, of all the economic data that came out, we covered the ECI. Which one would you pick to highlight? Well, I don't want to give my stat away for the oh, stats well, game, but you can. I would say second to the uh, ECI would be the PCE uh, inflation measure. This, in terms of understanding uh, Fed policy, right? That's the key gauge that they use. And that kind of came in according to script. PCE being as well. the consumer expenditure deflator. Correct. Correct. Right. That came out okay. this morning as well. Um, and what did it yeah. show? What's that? What did it show? Uh, 0.3%. Again, kind of uh, in line with uh, what we had in August. This 0.3% is the month over month for um, September. Uh, year over year, which is probably what people are most focused on, 6.2% on the headline. And then 5.1% on the core. And that was a bit up, but again, kind of in line with expectations. For that reason, I, I don't see the Fed changing course. Um, still too high, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's well above target. High. Yeah. Um, that should be 2%. That's their target. That's correct. the core, excluding food and energy, consumer expenditure deflator. That's what they, that's their benchmark inflation measure. That's, they target that to be two. We're at, Five, so five point one. So actually, yeah. going in the wrong direction over the last month. Yeah, but you know, but not not yeah. terrible. Annualized, it's kind of five ish or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, okay, um, uh, Mark, uh, do you want to talk about the uh, diffusion index, the survey you put together? Now, is that your favorite indicator? Uh, or <laughs> well, you know, all those. I mean, I, I know that's a little self serving if you if you pick that one. It sound it feels a little self serving. I mean, is that actually the best, the most important indicator that came out in your mind this week? I, I can't believe you would think that of me, Mark, really. Well, Self-serving? I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, that, so, was uh, that, was, that was harsh. I, yeah, I mean, that was harsh. That was harsh. Yeah. But, uh, well, let's put it this way. Let's put it in context. And I think it's we have to talk a little bit about the GDP numbers. Yeah. Can't kind of ignore mm -hmm. them. I was waiting for that. And so let's, let's do that. Uh, I'm 
I think my view is similar to what I think yours is, Mark. The, 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 the third quarter data showed what most of us, maybe all of us knew, is that we were not, in fact, in recession. At least by September 30th, uh, economy was still uh, moving forward. Uh, consumption numbers, you know, solid, not up, but solid. Um, but a couple of other signs in that report, you know, uh, net exports help put, push the number up. And I don't think anyone thinks that's going to be contributing a lot to GDP going forward. Uh, with the value of the dollar being so strong, this is, this is going to probably turn around and go the other way at some point. I don't know if it's next quarter or current quarter, next quarter, whenever. Um, we did see residential investment decline, uh, f fairly hefty uh, rate. I think that's totally to be expected with the interest rate hikes we've already seen from the Fed. But expect that to continue going forward. So there are some signs of uh, weakness to come in the GDP uh, uh, figures. And the question is, oh, the other, I guess the other thing to say is though, the overall GDP number being up, you know, let's call it two and a half percent to round. Um, it may, be, may suggest that productivity numbers were not quite as bad as one might have thought prior to that, which is good for the wage in relation to the wage number. So that's, that's the other point to make about that. But having said all that, there's, there's weakness coming. And I, I'm among those who think that the Fed needs to be mighty careful not to uh, uh, throw in all this monetary tightening uh, not see enough of a of an impact on the economy, and then just keep tightening until it does see the impact. Uh, for as long as macro has been taught, I think the the famous phrase is monetary policy operates with long and variable lags. If I know this, obviously the Fed knows this. Um, they've done a lot of tightening already. Um, you, you're you're probably right that the, the forecast for them adding another one and a half percentage points of tightening before pausing may be what they're going to do, but I'm not so sure that's what they ought to do. Mm. Now, e even in the context of that wage growth and that high inflation, and feels like inflation expectations are back pretty close to where they'd want to see them, but uh, feels fragile. Despite all that, you would if you, were, if you were on the FOMC, vote to what pause after this next rate hike. You know, I'm I'm not going to say what I would do because I I haven't spent enough time looking at as as much stuff as they look at. So, yeah. but I'm just saying that's there's a danger in over tightening, just as there is an under tightening. They do have a dual mandate, supposedly, although somehow half of that mandate tends to get lost when inflation becomes a concern. Um, and causing a recession to bring inflation down, uh, particularly in a world where, in my view, recession is, uh, excuse me, inflation is not primarily a function of too much demand at mm. this point. Mm -hmm. It's more a function of supply issues. I'd just be a little wary uh, because, because when that's the case, yeah, you can still make inflation go down by raising interest rates. But you really have to shove them up pretty high and really knock demand down. You pretty much have to have a recession uh, uh, for that to work. Not so sure that's what we want right now. I, I yeah. think I think that I I would I would think they have a little more time to be careful than to overdo it right now and tighten too much. That's my that's my view. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean I'm very sympathetic to what you just said. The the the, the pushback, and I think it's not an unreasonable one. Two things. One, uh, to get to they have a dual mandate: full employment, inflation that's low and stable. To get to full employment, though, a necessary condition is low and stable inflation. So you have to accomplish that; otherwise, you can't get the latter. You know, uh, full employment, at least not in a consistent way going forward. And in the and the second pushback is: yeah, the inflation is largely supply driven, but at this point, it's metastasized and you know infected the wage price di inflation expectations wage price dynamics and the only way to wring that out is you know a tight monetary policy uh and and that's you know even if you believe it was supply side driven at this point that doesn't that's almost not relevant because it's in the wage structure and we got to get that out and that means a weaker economy so that i, I hear you but i i can I, I understand the other side of it too but it's but i guess your broader point is and i totally agree there's two-sided risks here right 
then that's mm-hmm. what you're saying. It feels like what you're saying. Right. right. Monetary policy. Do right. you do an explicit forecast for the economy? I mean, like, do you have like a GDP forecast for 2023? No, uh, we, we, we tr- truly don't do forecasts um, uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, don't, uh, first of all, because we're not very good at them. Um, to, to do a real forecast, a real macro forecast, you really need to spend full time with, with smart people and look at the data carefully. And it's, as you mentioned, implicitly, if not explicitly, you got to look at the whole world. You can't even just look at the U.S. What's the point of having some other rump group of four researchers produce another bad macro forecast? Like, oh, why, why would we no. Why would we I, do I'd that? I welcome your forecast any day, Mark. No, no, yeah, no. We, yeah. we, sure we, you, you guys are out there. Why would we want to duplicate that? Our general view, this is a, uh, yeah. in research at NMAC, is we can't do everything. Let's not do things that other people are doing well. Let's okay. do things other people aren't doing and that are important to our industry. Perfect. So our industry That's doesn't fair. need another forecast. They Got particularly it. don't need another interest rate forecast. Yeah, well, that's um, that, talk about tough for, tough thing to forecast. Um, well, oh, just, but I, there's just, one it, forecast I'm going to ask you for, though, at the sure. end, at the end. And this has kind of been our way of gauging where, pe- where people's minds are on the economy. What do you think the probability of recession is over the next year? So... I'm going to press you a little bit on that, but not, 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 not now. Uh, you know, maybe towards the end of the conversation, we'll, we'll come back to that and see if we can't uh, engage you on, on that one. Uh, but, you know, my sense is looking at the data, by the way, my probability of recession actually came in this past week, just as a teaser. It just doesn't yeah. make sense. Just doesn't <laughs> make sense. <laughs> this past week, the data, it was about as good as it possibly could get, you know, from, from it could have been better, but it was pretty good. I mean, the GDP number positive, but clearly it's going to slow. You know, you got juice exactly. by temporary. But exactly. that's a good thing. That's exactly what we need. <laughs> we need GDP to, it's been flat since the end of last year, gone nowhere. And that's exactly where we want it, right? Because if you want uh, the economy to cool off without going into recession, that, that feels like I couldn't draw the line any better than that. And it feels like that's the kind of growth. No growth we're going to get, you know, going forward here, uh, given the the internals of the of the GDP number, the wage growth that feels like that's you know, rolling over, peaking. Uh, the the uh, inflation numbers, you know, that was to script. I and that feels like that's peaking and going to roll over. Uh, I don't know. I just I came away think. And then of course all the financial market uh, response has been pretty constructive, right? I mean, got. 10 year yields at 4%, but the stock market's hanging in tough. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, credit spreads are, are, are not, uh, they're, they're consistent with the non recession mm-hmm. scenarios. It all feel, I mean, my, I feel better about the economy today and its prospects than I did a week ago. So you're sure sticking with Goldilocks. All right. Good. Yeah. Just, I just, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we'll come back to that. Uh, all depends so, on the uh, Phillies then. <laughs> it, it, I think it, a lot depends on those Phillies. Uh, yeah. You're, you make a good point. Um, okay, so we let's do this. Let's talk about the multifamily market in more detail, and then we'll come back and play the statistics game because we we've already digest a lot of statistics. So let's uh, let's uh, save the game for uh, uh, later in the conversation in the multifamily market. And uh, here, at Mark, I think this is a good place to bring in the uh, survey, the quarterly survey, because I think that says it all. Do you want to describe the results there and what what you think it means? Yeah, sure. Let me just quickly uh, describe for those not familiar with it, uh, what the survey is. Every quarter we send out to most of our members uh, four questions. And it's just, we, we try to get quick responses and then turn the data around real quickly. So it's not detailed data. It's just sort of quick, uh, qualitative answers to questions. And is as you say, it's a diffusion type index. So we asked, first of all, a market tightness question. So compared with three months ago, are the markets you are familiar with or operate in showing higher rents and higher occupancies, lower rents and lower occupancies, or about the same? Uh, and that's our, we get produce an index number like most of these things. 50 means it's essentially unchanged. Above 50, things are getting stronger or growing. And below 50, it's the other way around. Um, 
we had had, let's, uh, let me take a quick look here. One, two, three, four, five, six quarters where the market tightness index was above 50. Not always much above 50, but at least a little bit above 50, indicating that, you know, that we're seeing uh, tighter markets on balance in most places. Uh, and then in, uh, in the data released this morning, the number fell to 20. So that's well below 50, indicating that in, uh, in, in a, on a broad array of markets, things are slowing. We're seeing slower rent growth and or uh, higher vacancy rates. Um, that was a pretty sharp turnaround. Um, and again, just on when, interpretation, I know economists understand how to interpret this, but not everyone follows this in detail. A low number doesn't mean that rents dropped a lot or that vacancy rates went up a lot. It means that they went up across a broad section of uh, markets, right? So they may have only dropped a little bit, but it's just the direction that we're looking at. So the direction on a, on a wide basis. So well, just, to, just to that? make that point. Just Sorry? a technical question. So yep. what if rent growth slows? Would that that would be consistent with a uh, easing in market tightness, would it not? Or does it actually um, have to decline? Does rent, do rents actually have to decline for people? Uh, the way we asked the question, uh, we're trying to get them to tell us uh, not about rent growth, but about rents. Um, oh, OK, OK. So, uh, so but, 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 in, but in fact, but in fact, you know, people answer the way they want to answer. So I think many people answer uh, as you would, Mark, which is mm -hmm. that if we had been seeing uh, year over year growth rates of 8% in rents and now it's 4%, they'll probably say compared with three months ago, that's lower. Right. The, the trickiest question is what if rents are going up and vacancy rates are also going up, then what do they say? But that doesn't happen so often that it's a problem. Right. In the 20, so just to uh, 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 articulate it, the, this is, when you say diffusion index, this is the number of uh, the percentage of folks saying, respondents to saying that conditions are tightening less, the, or, or easing, I should say, uh, less the percent that say they're tightening. Yes, and, and we do show those numbers too. You can find them on our website. You can get the actual percentage of people okay. answers. And so on that question, we had 66 percent of respondents uh, say that conditions were looser than mm -hmm. three months ago and 5% who said they were tighter. So you take that difference, which is, let's call it 60%, divide by two, 30%, and subtract that from 50, and that gets you your 20. Right. And, and let me know if I'd said that too fast. I think he, I got it. Did you guys get yep. it? Yeah, okay. So two questions. One, it's t on the market tightness question, it's 20% percent or percentage it's just a 20 it's just an 20, index number just a no it's an index unit. number 20 yeah. um when's the last time it was that low and I, I abstracting from i'm sure it was about that low in the teeth of the pandemic shutdowns i'm sure it got that low in july it was, 2020 it was 19 19 okay and then what do you have to go all the way back to the great financial crisis to find something as low as that um well uh april of 2020 it was 12. okay okay, <laughs> okay. so then yes before before that you have to get back to 2009 2008 um yeah i think the lowest number we ever showed though was in 2001. Hmm. it fell to four was that like 9 11 or something um it was it was yes it was the fourth quarter of 2001 it yeah. was 9 11. 9 11. Hmm. yeah that makes sense. And the second question, what was the high point? So if I go back, my sense is a year ago, probably it, m the market was a very tight. And what was what was the reading then? Well, uh, a year ago, so we had 79, 77, 79, 79, okay. 79 yeah. in the first three quarters of 2021. Yeah. And yeah. so you so again, that's what that's indicating is that uh, a broader array of markets are showing tightening across three straight quarters. Right. We're seeing a, a broad, a broad uh, level of tightening of uh, of the, the, the physical space market for apartments. Right. OK, so I go back a year ago. It was tight. The market was tight. Market Close was tightening, a, tight, tightening. And I, I would also say when you say tight, but yes, based on but other I, data. Yeah, I would say Not that based but on I, this survey. Yeah, yeah. but I, I yes, right, yeah. exactly. You you would say it was tight. Yes, rents were rising rapidly, double digit year over year growth, accelerating vacancy rates, 
low and falling, maybe not record low, but pretty close. Would that be a fair characterization? Uh, yes, it would. World? Yeah, absolutely. And broad based. I mean, across much of the country, it was everywhere. Rank yes. Was, yeah. Uh, and and it, it feels like it's come off, fallen off a cliff from a, a year ago, certainly in the last few in the last quarter, it feels like a bit off a cliff, right? Is that fair, fair to characterize it? Um, uh, I think we don't know that for sure yet. I think what we're okay. seeing is so the, the, if you look at the month to month rent increases, um, the, 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 the peak was actually probably sometime last summer, maybe late last summer, and they've been moderating since then by some data, the September number month to month. So September over August 2022 was flat and maybe down slightly in so absolute the peak, terms. The peak was summer of 2021. The peak in in monthly rent, rent growth. Yeah, was was summer 2021. 2020. Right. Yes. Yeah. 2021. And so it, so the okay. rate of growth has been easing off a little bit and it may it, it seems to be flat and maybe declining a bit in September with the pro have to also say um, that there is some seasonality to the rent numbers, but we don't see seasonally adjusted numbers produced typically. These are mostly by private data sources. And so you have to sort of make a qualitative adjustment in your head and say, it might be just seasonality right now. Let's see several months worth before we make draw too many conclusions yet. Now, let me to the le listener, let me just say the reason I'm pressing so hard here is because this is really critical to understanding what it means for future inflation. We're gonna come back to that in just a minute, but to nail this down, this kind of pattern that we're observing is really, really important to inflation. Uh, how's the cost of housing and ultimately inflation, because the cost of housing is such a key component of inflation. That's, uh, that's why I'm really pressing here. So my characterization of what you said is, market was really tight uh, or tightening, but if I look at the broad set of data it feels like it was really tight and rent growth on a month to month basis, sequential basis was, was peaking back in the summer of 2021. And now here we are a little over a year later, things are e easing very quickly. The market is loosening. It's not loose, I'd say, but it's loosening because vacancy rates are still low and uh, rent growth is now feels like if not declining, pretty close to decline. Is that fair, the way I just described it? I think that's fair, yeah. Okay, okay, very good. Hey, well, one quick question, just uh, I should have asked earlier, who responds to this exactly? I know they're your members, but who are your members exactly? Good, that's right, good question. So uh, it, essentially anyone in the apartment industry can be a member, um, but, but that means as a practical matter, we have uh, uh, apartment owners, property managers, uh, developers. We also have brokers. We also have lenders. And we also have a few suppliers of different types, whether that's people who supply washing machines to the industry. It also means service suppliers. So there are some legal services, some architectural firms that are members, that sort of thing. They don't make up the bulk. We don't send out our survey to all those folks. So we, we pretty much confine it to uh, owners, managers, developers, um, and then lenders and brokers who we figure have a sense for what the markets are doing. Got it. Got it. So pretty broad array of, of uh, stakeholders in the multifamily market. You get right. And they see the market from different sides. And the other thing is we've only talked about one of the questions. We do have other questions that are more on the investment side. So we, we get at that side of it too. And hence, you do want some of those players answering these kinds of questions as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And what I noticed was uh, on those other questions, pretty large declines in pricing. So multi, it sounds like, or I should say volume, sale, sales volume. So these are transactions. And I mentioned pricing, but in the context of equity and debt uh, financing, particularly debt, that looked like it really, that probably goes to bank lending to the multifamily sector. That feels like that really came, came off pretty considerably in the last quarter. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's only, for only the second time. We've been doing this survey since the uh, middle of 1999. So, and only wow. the second time in this history did not a single person say that now is a better time to borrow. Yeah, right. Well, uh, I've, been, I've actually had a lot of bankers in the CRE space uh, mention. And in fact, when I was 
speaking at your your uh, your uh, conference in DC a few uh, I guess it was a couple of months ago it came up that uh, bankers uh, particularly the big guys feel like they're under a lot of regulatory scrutiny and that the Federal Reserve and others are raising capital standards with regard to their multifamily lending and that is really having an impact on their ability to provide credit is that and, and, it, and we've had uh, some people uh, tell us that some banks, and I don't think I will name them, but have been yeah. told not to make uh, loans to, to apartment uh, owners or developers at this point. So uh, whether that's what everyone is hearing or what these individuals have been hearing from the banks, I, I can't say for certain, but there's no question that, that banks are pulling back. And even those that don't, uh, you know, you, you have... The, the dual uh, impact of the rates themselves are much higher now than they were six months ago. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, what we call proceeds, that is to say, you know, the, you, they won't give you uh, 80%. Now it's maybe 75% or maybe it's 65% or whatever it might be. So uh, the amount of debt financing you can do mm -hmm. is a smaller share of the total capital stack. So uh, in that sense too, it's a tougher time to, to borrow. Right. Well, let's talk about uh, uh, what is driving all this. Uh, and, you know, like everything in economics, it, it comes down to demand and supply. So uh, I don't know how you want to frame this or where you want to begin, but what was driving the very tight market, uh, tightening market back in the summer of 2021 and now uh, is, is driving the you know, pullback in in uh, in the market. Uh, what what would you put? There's a long list of demand supply issues here. What would you put at the top of the list of, of reasons for this, what we're observing here? This is going to be the easiest question you will ask me this entire podcast. Oh, is that right? Okay. It is. We haven't produced anywhere near enough housing of any type. Okay. Pretty much anywhere in the country. So by any type, I mean uh, for sale and for rent. I mean it's you had. People talk about double digit rent increases year over year. Yeah, they were 10% in some cases, but home prices were up 20%, 25 So when both for sale and for rent, rental housing is, uh, is seeing these kinds of increases, that tells you that the demand is not being, has not been met by a sufficient supply. Um, and we've been underbuilding for, yeah, you could argue since the you know bursting of the house price bubble, and things, you know, of course, collapsed after that, but then we haven't really gotten back on track fully since then. And um, for reasons, I, I'm not sure I, I know all of them, but uh, the demand was slower to come back. But boy, once it did, uh, we, you, we, we found out just how little housing we had built and, and how badly we needed it. And so I think more than anything else, the, 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 the lack of housing supply is what's caused the tightness in the in both the, for the home for home ownership and for rental housing. Now, obviously, Fed's uh, 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 tightening of uh, monetary policy has affected the, the the for sale market quickly, and things are turning around much more rapidly there. Um, but anyway, I think that's the underlying issue, and you know whatever kind of cyclical downturn or slow down we're facing in the next six, 12, however many, 18 months. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think this undersupply issue is going away. And I think we're, you know, either now or then we're going to need to build a lot more housing. Okay. So uh, the, the entire housing market is undersupply, both on the rental side where you're focused and on the, on the home ownership side. The, in fact, I think the home ownership vacancy rate is, is even is at a record low. It's never been as low. So it's even it's, on that based on that measure, it's even tighter than the rental market. So that explains partially what hap the tightness that we ob have observed. Uh, it was certainly back summer of 2021. That underlying tightness in the market helped to well, you got to pick up in demand coming out of the uh, out of the pandemic. The economy reopened. Households started to form that had not formed during the teeth of the pandemic. So that surge in demand uh, bumped up against that lack of supply and that caused rent growth to, to go skyward, you know, back again, a, a little over a year ago when the market was as tight as it was. Is that is that a fair characterization of, of yeah, that dynamic? Okay. For sure. 
Yeah. But now here we are today, we still have that undersupply. You know, it doesn't feel like that's gotten any better. Vacancy rates across uh, vacancy, vacancy rates in, uh, are as low as they were a year ago. But now we have rent growth falling off sharply uh, and now rent declines in more markets. So how, so what goes to that dynamic? What what has caused that? Well, that's uh, that's. That, that's a demand side phenomenon, demand of side. course. Okay, and um, it's it's, uh, but one has to be a little careful here. So it's demand side. It's it's caused by uh, at some level, obviously the Fed tightening monetary policy. But um, it hasn't it hasn't yet been the case that we've seen uh, uh, people who are looking to uh, rent apartments. Uh, uh, sh showing up with lower and lower incomes, and therefore it's an, an immediately an affordability problem. That's actually not been the case. Here's a couple of interesting statistics from some earning calls from apartment REITs this week. Uh, Equity Residential or EQR, which is the biggest apartment REIT by market capitalization anyway, uh, they said in the last 12 months, the average income of someone who signs a new lease on one of their apartments. This is not the statistics game, but, uh, but think what, what that number might be in your head. And then I'll tell you the actual number, it's $174,000. And I'm guessing wow. that's higher than what wow. you may have had in your head. About $100,000 yeah. or more. Yeah. So, yeah. so they're, not, they're not having a problem with people being unable to pay the rents. That's not yet, that's not yet what the problem is. Uh, similarly, again, EQR says the rent to income ratio for these people signing new leases is 20% or a little less. The other largest apartment REIT, Mid-America Apartments or MAA, the largest by number of apartment units owned, although they own them in somewhat less expensive markets, so the capitalization is the same, but different point. They say the number is uh, the rent to income uh, figure for their new lease signings is around 22%. So neither of these is showing the kind of stress level that would suggest affordability is sort of pulling back on demand. So can, what it can means- I, Can I push back just a little bit before we move on? So for sure. these are high end though, rental, right? Yeah. This is not bread and butter uh, workforce rental or affordable rental right which is you know, uh, well, is that is that right right or wrong of course of, of course yeah. that's correct yeah okay but it, but okay. it's that's in some so these are market rate rentals equity residential has probably higher end than mid-america does but that's mostly by markets that they're in mid-america much more in the you know the so southern tier and 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 mid America, as the name might suggest, and EQR much more on the coast and the expensive markets. Um, but you see this replicated uh, throughout the entire market rate industry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, another one of the private data providers. I don't know if I'm supposed to not say their name no, or no, say no, their name. Away. We're, we're, so uh, we're so good real with any competition. Okay, yeah. no, it was not yeah. a competition. Yeah, so yeah. real page. Um, uh, had uh, it, it looked at the data that they, they have a large sample. I don't remember how many millions of apartments that they're looking at, but uh, the median, I believe it's the median, not the mean, the median rent to income ratio. This is going to be on new lease signings because once someone signed a lease, uh, no one's keeping track of incomes anymore. So, mm -hmm. but but that's it's still 23%. Okay, so and this is so it's not just the the so-called luxury, which really just means higher end. It's not, but um, not just there, but it's, it, but it's also not the entire market. So I accept that, that there's a, there are a lot of apartments that are not in that set of uh, things. But anyway, uh, this my is point- only, There's a lot of suspense here. So like- Yeah, so my, yeah. my point, my point to all of this is that yeah. what is happening is that there's a great deal more uncertainty about what the future is holding. So people may still have good incomes, but I think they're getting a little more uh, nervous about what the next year is going to bring, and and uh, and uh, and so uh, so a couple of things happened. You're seeing fewer people walking in and uh, looking to, to 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 lease, so new lease up traffic is down. On the other hand, not many people are leaving either, so move outs are also down. The renewals is a very high number right now. 
part of that is some of these people would have moved out to buy a home and that's about the last thing they want to do right now, both with mortgage rates and, again, that economic uncertainty of not being sure what the world is going to look like in a, in a year from now. So maybe this isn't the best time to sign a 30-year contract. So you're saying it, it's not that rents have gotten so high that it's gobbling up such a large share of people's income that they can't afford it, and therefore you're getting demand destruction. You know, People are, aren't renting because they just simply can't. You're saying... They've got the income. It feels like they've got the income because the rent to income ratios are still kind of okay in the 20, 25% range. And, and just as a benchmark, people kind of think if it's over a third, you got a real affordability problem. So 20, 25% seems, you know, okay. That That's not it. It's that people are just so very nervous about, will they have that same income, uh, you know, six months from now, a year from now. That's that's what you're saying. Um. So yeah, yeah. So let me let's be clear. So the first part of that is data, and the second part of that is my trying yeah. to understand mm -hmm. the data. So just yeah. to be clear, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're very careful. Do you notice that, Chris? He's like, oh yeah, incredibly careful. I will, yeah, yeah. But that this must imply that the new household formations are not coming online, right? The system is, if it's still functioning, right, and the rents are not increasing, right? It must mean you're not getting. Uh, new entrants coming in, pushing up rent prices further, right? So is is that where we're seeing the uh, the effect here? The younger adult is not moving out because of the uncertainty or they're doubling up, tripling up. Boy, I, w I wish I had data on that, Chris. Do you know where I can find any? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, uh, logically, no, sir no, logically, that would- But that's what's going on, right? right. I mean yeah. So no, that that makes total sense. I, I think we, we saw some- um, What's the right word? Unbundling of households in, uh, in you know, from the early in the pandemic through like a year ago or so, maybe maybe to earlier this year, um, more people forming households and m maybe sort of pushed some household formation from the future to the present. And now we're seeing maybe a little bit more doubling up again. Um, and th it, whether that's people who were going to move out from their roommates and then decided not to let's just let's just sit let's just let's sign another 12 month lease on this so they they didn't form a new household or people in other living situations that, that didn't form a house so i th i think that's happening obviously don't can't prove that data just yet chris is it so does that resonate with you chris or if if, if, you, if i yeah. asked you the same question what would you put it would at the top of the list of reasons for this what we're observing in the rental market does does that sound right? Yeah, that, yeah. My narrative is that there is demand destruction in the form of those household formations not occurring. Right? It's not that people are pulling back to the extent that you know, they, based on what Mark has suggested, that they're not uh, pulling back and doubling up, tripling up it to a large degree. It's just that the new households that should be coming online just aren't. They're just suppressed. Right, and that is causing the prices to to moderate here. I've got one other possible explanation I want to put forward. But before I do that, I want to call out uh, Chris's glasses. Have you guys noticed Chris's glasses? It looks like he's got diamond-studded glasses. What are you talking about? Are, are, no, these look are, at that. These yeah, are look plastic. At that. Oh, are they? Yeah. Don't they look diamond-studded <laughs> to you guys? What are you, what are you talking about? No. Yeah, no, they don't. They don't. Okay. <laughs> Oh, Mark's got Mark, the fancy like, ones. Yeah, look yeah. at that. Yeah, he's got the fancy ones. He's yeah. the one also, well. also plastic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Just setting that straight. Uh, here's the other possible explanation, or and I agree. It, this is more secondary or tertiary. It's not at the top. I think, I think your explanation makes the most sense. Could it be remote work dynamics? So uh, we saw a surge of folks during the early part of the pandemic. First, say 2020, going into certainly the first. In fact, if you look at our data on migra net migration out of urban areas into other parts of the country, it peaked, I think, in the summer. Of I think it was actually June of 2021 it actually peaked. So you saw a lot of folks moving from these high-cost, high-rent areas in the northeast into the lower-cost, low-rent areas in the southeast over into Texas, and a lot of folks leaving California and Seattle and moving into the Mountain West, same dynamic. And that, uh, that caused a very significant increase in demand and thus rent in those areas in the southeast and mountain west that uh, kind of if you look at the rent data across metropolitan area that's where you've seen the, the biggest rent 
it, and it really didn't have the same depressing effect on rents in those big urban areas. They kind of moderated, it came in a little bit more during the teeth of the pandemic, but uh, just because of the, <clears throat> uh, the kind of the arithmetic here, it's juiced up uh, rent growth in those, in those other markets, uh, those markets in the Southeast and in, in the Mountain West. Does that, and that, and now what's happening is since uh, summer of 2021, we still see a lot of uh, folks leaving the big urban areas, but much, much less so than was, was the case, you know, back a year and a half ago. And so the, this dynamic is starting to wear off and the impact on rents are, are now it's depressing rents as opposed to juicing rents. Does that, does that resonate? Does that sound r- roughly right? Well, a couple of things. So uh, it, it's a, it's a, so th- my, my example of exactly that phenomenon is Boise, Idaho. Boise, right. by the way, Boise, no, the, the no, mayor please. makes a oh, here we really, go. Here we yeah, go. really important point. It's not Boise, it's Boise, Boise. They get very annoyed in Boise when people say Boise. Just saying. Thank, thank you for correcting me on that one. <laughs> I, I do want to say it correctly. Um, but when, you know, if 50,000 households leave Seattle and move to, let's say, Idaho, right. um, the, the impact on the Seattle housing market is essentially nil. Yeah, exactly. But the impact mm-hmm. on the Idaho market is exactly. you've just blown out the entire market. There are yeah. no more houses left in Idaho. You said it beautifully. That's exactly the, the what I wanted to say. But that was and and that's said. that's why the city of Boise uh, had the highest you know house house price increase for one of those twelve month periods during that during the last couple of years. Um, and, and, and now they're negative because a few people left. It, it just, it's a smaller market. It doesn't take as many in absolute numbers to sort of uh, uh, juice it or, or, or knock it down. So I think that's, true, that's truly what, what has happened there. For the larger narrative, I'm a little agnostic, not because I think it's wrong, but just because I think uh, I'm trying, you know, it's, it's easy to come to snap conclusions th- that are wrong. And we've seen this any number of times. We go back to 9-11. No one's ever going to want to live in a big city again. Really? That was about the best 10-year stretch big cities in the U.S. have ever had in, in recent years. Um, and then, you know, we had the Great Resignation. Uh, actually, people got sick. That was, you know, and they couldn't go to work. Or they kids weren't in school, so they had to stay home and watch them. Not really the great. Now we have quiet quitting. Do we though? Do we really? I'm not so sure. So, and I know that you. It's not anything that you suggest, Mark. But the, but these things become memes in the popular press, and everyone yeah. says they're true until everyone forgets them, and then you forget that you ever said any of those things, and it's gone. I think work from home is is different. It's no question. It's it's it. It had been happening anyway. It had been on the increase. We've probably moved it forward quite a bit because of the pandemic. Um, but not everyone can work from home. So it's still a minority of people who are in a position to be able to work from home. So we have to just keep that part of it in mind. And the other thing is, it's not as if, wow, I don't have to, you know, I, I, I work in downtown Manhattan and it's such a horrible commute to come in from New Jersey. So I had better live in downtown Manhattan so I don't have a horrible commute, but it's costing me a lot of money. Now I don't have to, you know, I'm going to move to New Jersey. Really? Um, there's a lot of good things in New Jersey. Don't get me wrong, but it's not like people don't want to be in New York. Mm. You know, New York's been around a long time, not as long as Paris, but you know, same issue there. Paris is always going to be Paris. New York's going to be New York. People are going to want to move there. People want to move to San Francisco. If they just build housing in San Francisco, they're going to attract a lot more people. They'd stop leaving. And actually, I have some hope that that uh, under the current administration, they may actually be moving towards uh, improving the housing construction in, in California. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, so I take your point, Mark. And I, it's not that I think it's wrong, but I think there are a couple of trends going on here, and um, and and we'll see where they play out. Well, but I really I really think that some of these cities just need to build more housing, and they wouldn't be quite so unaffordable, and they'd be they'd be far better off. To that point. Uh, and I totally agree. Uh, we are seeing more supply, and this goes now to a little bit to the outlook for uh, the multifamily market and rents and what it might mean for inflation. It feels like we got this demand issue, and that's not going to go away. If it's if it if it's uncertainty or income and or both, 
that doesn't feel like that's going to get any better over the next six, 12 months. You know, the economy under any scenario is going to be under a lot of pressure. The job market is definitively going to slow by definition because the Fed's going to make sure that that happens. Uh, and then also on the supply side of the market, it does feel like we're getting more supply, right? And in fact, if you look at multifamily starts, uh, mm -hmm. that is a pretty high level historically, not the highest it's ever been, but it's, it's within spitting distance. And you also have a lot of multifamily property in the pipeline going to completion, haven't been able to get across the finish line because of supply chain issues and can't get appliances, can't get building materials, whatever it is to finish, or labor because of the pandemic, as you pointed out. But as those issues iron themselves out, as the supply chains continue to ease, as labor markets ease up, we should start to see that uh, those properties that are in the pipeline come to completion. So we should get more supply. So. I just painted a picture of continued weak demand, some improved supply. That suggests that rent growth, vacancy should be no longer falling, maybe even rising, and rent growth should remain under pressure at least over the next year or so. Does that does that sound right? Does that resonate for you? That that framework. Um, yes, but 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 uh, but central to the point that you're making is the slowdown that the Fed is engineering. So were it not for that, uh, the level of new, uh, I look at completions rather than starts uh, for a minor technical reason that uh, the way it's calculated, some of the some of the starts that are listed as multifamily are actually not, they're just, uh, they're, they're duplexes, they're townhouses. So they really single family attached housing. So it's not literally part of the multifamily housing. So the, by the time they get it completed, it gets corrected. So completions number typically lower than the starts number for that reason as well as some others. But but anyway, so but the number the numbers have been picking up. Actually, they went they're sort of down this year over last couple of years. But at the levels, you're looking at three hundred and fifty thousand five plus. So, so units in buildings with at least five units in the building. Um, back in the early to mid 80s, you were looking at 500,000 and above. Back in the early 70s, you were looking at over 700,000, almost 800,000 one year. And the, so if, if you, if you, to the extent that you think generations matter, and I, I'm, I'm willing to say that we can easily exaggerate the importance of the generations moving through the pipeline. But when the baby boomers came online, there was a lot of concern. Uh-oh, we're going to have to build a lot of housing. And we did. We built a ton of new housing. Um, and they came, but coming online for them was in two waves, one before and then after the big recession of 80, 81, 82, have ruined account that. Um, but when the, the what we used to one time called echo boomers, Gen Y, whatever, however you want to define them anymore, millennials, I don't know how, how people define any of these generations anymore, but they're at least as big as the baby boomers. And we're not seeing a comparable increase, at least on the multifamily side of new construction. So these numbers, they may look large relative to you know everything we've seen since 1990 on, but in the broader context, I, I don't think they're at all out of out of line, except that no, we might need no. except that we might need more of them. This might no, no, not no, still no, be not enough. Arguing, not arguing that okay. at all. But okay. in, in terms of what it means, I'm, I'm, I'm focused like a laser beam on rent growth because we're going to in a minute take this back to inflation. In in my mind, rent growth is driven by the vacancy rate, and the vacancy rate is driven by the change in demand and supply. And we're we've we were all on the same page around demand remaining weak, maybe even declining for the reasons we discussed. And I'm arguing we're going to get more supply. It's still not you know 1980s, which by the way was all juiced by tax incentives. So and then uh, that you know juiced that up, and then we saw a crash in the multifamily market after that because of the high vacancy rates that resulted. But but regardless of that, that we're going to get more supply. So that means to me that rent growth in 2023 <clears throat> is going to be soft. I mean, maybe even declines in rent growth. That That's where I'm going. Does that does that sound right? Chris, does that sound right to you, that forecast? It does. I don't know about declines, but flat yeah. would be my... Yeah, that, we may not get declines. Yeah, that might be... Because there's landlords are going to be pretty reluctant to cut cut rents in a broad-based way, at least consistently. Does that make sense yeah. to you, Mark, or am I overstating the case? 
no, I think I think it makes sense. Um, uh, with as long as when we're talking about rent growth, we're sticking with this month to month change and not looking back twelve months, and because those numbers take forever to actually turn oh, around. I mean, yeah. the year so over year can be the year over year amazing. numbers, oh, which yeah, is going to yeah. in oh, a moment oh, get yeah. to the inflation <laughs> question. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So I want to talk about connect the dots back to inflation. <clears throat> And Marissa, can I call you back into the conversation? Of course. Can you can you um, can you give us a, a kind of a primer on how uh, rents get into uh, measures of inflation, like the CPI and the in the core uh, con in the expenditure, the consumer expenditure deflator? Yeah. So shelter costs make up a very large proportion of the CPI. They're a third, I believe, yeah. of the overall mm -hmm. CPI. Um, and that, so that's not only rents, but that's also so-called homeowners equivalent rent, which is sort of the implicit rent that a homeowner pays him or herself every month. So it's a, it's a huge portion alone of, of the way the government measures inflation, which means it, it means a lot for what we see in month over month and year over year measures of inflation. So the CPI looks at both, uh, new they, they ask the people what they are paying for rent they're they're also asking about new rents and they're asking about renewed rents right so if you stay in the same apartment and your lease comes up for renewal they ask about that there's some evidence that at least looking at private sector sources and mark i'm sure you know this is what you can look at too is that people signing brand new rents right now are seeing much softer rental price increases than say a year ago or so so that the renewals are still kind of hanging up there but the, but the new rent signers are seeing weaker pricing for rent because of the way the government calculates rents that'll take quite a while to show up in the CPI. So there's gonna be this very long lag catch up effect before any softening in new rents shows up in the CPI data. In fact, you know, I've been reading a lot about it and we've talked about, I think you guys have talked about it before on the podcast. It could be a year before we start actually seeing that manifesting itself in the official inflation uh, I, statistics. I think six, nine, 12 months, we should start to see. Yeah. Some some effects, yeah. Some meaningful. This is a very long lag item, yeah. right? Somebody signs a rent; it's usually for a year, so that rent right. that price is not going <laughs> to reset again for another year. So it's harder to capture, you know, changes that are happening right now in the market in the CPI data, which kind of goes back to Mark's uh, concern that you know the Fed is looking at data that might might actually be lagging and trying to hammer down inflation and. But but there is a lag with a lot of this stuff, right? So um, there is that uh, there is that risk that they're they could overdo it. Yeah, Chris, do you want to add anything to that uh, description of the? Link <laughs> no, I think she, I, I she think she it. would okay. laid it out so, perfectly. Okay, so this goes to my outlook for inflation and my somewhat more optimistic perspective on what it means for monetary policy and ultimately what it means for the risk of recession, it feels like to me that uh, the cost of housing in the uh, inflation statistics, uh, particularly the CPI, are peaking right now. It reflects this very, very tight, tightening market, rental market that we had back a year ago, uh, you know, in Mark's survey when we were peaking in terms of tightness. Uh, when rent growth was at its uh, peak month to month, year over year. And uh, that probably will continue to put upper pressure on the inflation numbers here for the next few months. But as we move into next year, and certainly by this time next year, uh, we are going to see a significant, meaningful moderation in the cost of housing in the CPI and the core in the uh, consumer expenditure flare, given, given the market conditions, rental uh, rents we're seeing that right now and just what we just established will be pretty weak rent growth if any rent growth in the coming year so as we make our way towards the end of next year going into 2024 this significant tailwind to inflation is going to become 
certainly going to blow a lot less harder. It may actually become you know a bit of a headwind to inflation. It's key to getting inflation back down. How how would you react to that that uh, that uh, narrative, uh, uh, Mark? Do you have a perspective on that? Does that sound roughly right to you, or do you have a different perspective? No, it sounds exactly right. I, I would just a, qu- a quick little point, just uh, people not misunderstand. Uh, there's no complaint about how the CPI measures rents. What they're doing is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. There's nothing unreasonable about it, but it is true, as Marissa says. 11 twelfths of the respondents to the survey are going to say, my rent did not increase. Zero, zero from last month. And that's what it should say, because that's what it's trying to measure. It's just not as good an indicator of what's happening at the margin, what's happening in markets today. Now, you know this, Marissa knows this, Chris knows this, I know this. Obviously, the Fed has to know this too. It's not that they don't know this. They have great analysts and researchers and sure. economists at the Fed. The question is, how will they react to knowing that? That's what I don't know. And as you say, I think it's, it's, a, re- it's a reason I think they just need to be careful about uh, not, not going too far and then have built too much tightening into the system. We, we obviously, if they did nothing else, on, on tightening, we would already still see rents uh, p- pausing, you know, f- flattening, maybe declining going into middle of next year. He's so, a real dove, Chris, isn't he? I mean, Mark. It Mark, sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, man, yeah. what a dove. Oh, yeah. He'd, he'd, he'd skew the whole FOMC if he got on that, uh, on the, on the, on the Fed. Uh, yeah, well. They need a little bit more uh, diversity of thought there. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, they, they could use a well. I won't say that. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, got it. Hey, uh, Chris, you heard my kind of frame there. What do you think? Yeah, I I agree with that. But that's yeah. a year out still, right? So that's why I. Mark, he's he's uh, the you know <laughs> if he gets appointed to the board, these guys are going to keep raising rates till <laughs> you know, to the sky. We're going into recession. No, I'm not saying that's yeah. what they should do. I think that's uh, what they will they, do. They would do. Yeah, they'll, they're going to overstep because of the credibility issues. Hey, let's. Uh, we're running out of time. Let's play the game. This is kind of uh, we'll end the conversation with the with the with the game, the fun part, the statistics game. And that is, we each put forward a statistic. Uh, the rest of us try to figure that out through questions and and clues, deductive reasoning. The best question is one that's um, not so easy. We get it immediately. One that's not so hard. We never get it. And one that's apropos, hopefully, to the data that's been released or the discussion at hand. So with that. Let me turn to you, Marissa. What's your statistic of the week? Negative. Are you sure? Are you sure it's negative? I am. I had to double check it, but yes. Mark, she has a bit of dyslexia on these uh, (laughs) lines. Okay. Well, this is a tough crowd here. This is a tough crowd. I know, We're very serious about this game. It's quite the initiation into the podcast for me. It's like a roast. Okay, so the the number... (laughs) is negative 1.63% in August. This came out th- this week. Came out this week. Yeah. And for the month of August, August, down 1.63%. Is it a house price? Yes. Is it the house prices in the West? No. Uh, in, for the month of August, it declined 1.6% in some okay. region of the country? No, nationwide. It didn't fall 1.6% nationwide, did it? You're like somewhere in somewhere. You're you're the correct answer is somewhere in the middle of what you're saying. Oh, your guesses. Is this the FHFA series? No. Is it the S and P Case Shiller? Case Shiller, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's Case Shiller. Okay, and it's not. It is it month to month. Yeah. Okay, and it, it's not the nation. I know that. Uh, and it's not a region. San Francisco. No. Is it the 10 city average? The no, twenty but city. You're, yes, Mark. Mark gets it. Oh, okay. It's the twenty okay. city case Schiller. Okay, very composite good. Composite index. Uh, I, I, wait, he gets it. He gets yeah, the credit for that. He said the he correct took it the last. He took it the last <laughs> centimeter. I took it all the way up to the line. <laughs> Nevertheless, he answered correctly. Mark, I'll, I'll be happy to share the trophy with you and all the earnings involved. You are way too nice, man. You're way <laughs> too nice. Yeah, we, we're a cutthroat here. No, no, you deserve it. Uh, you get a cowbell for that. I think we got, we got some extra cowbells. Um, okay, so why'd you pick that, Mirsa? So I picked it for, I think, this discussion of 
how we've been talking about the multifamily market, but we know the single family market pricing is and demand has fa right falling off a cliff. Really, um, this is the second straight month of price declines in the Case Shiller. Um, when you look month on month, still up strongly over 13% if you look year over year at prices. But I what what I, I picked this one because not because the top line statistic is so interesting, but because every single one of the 20 cities in the composite had a price decline mm. over the month. Every single one of Even the 20 Philly? cities. I don't think Philly's in that index though. Philly is not in it. Yeah, no, right. no, Should Philly be. is not in it. Mark, why, why don't they have Philly in that index? That's just bizarre. It's like the key market i, I didn't they, do the index can't can't help you on that all right okay. they have cleveland they have I, minneapolis hey, Mar, hey, chris, they don't have I th philly i think we need to construct our own index what do you think chris yeah mm. yeah, that, yeah that might be a good mm. idea <laughs> yeah and chris what did our index say <laughs> and in fact we have data for for what month chris for uh, september uh, september oh, yeah. even yeah, more yeah. timely you know yes. so what do you about say? that what, what do you is, know what the number is, is mark uh, i do I don't. indeed you don't know oh you do oh 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 yeah negative negative National nationwide house prices, yeah, down six tenths of a percent. Yeah, yeah. and annualized it peaked. It, our data shows the, the national house prices actually peaked in July, so it was uh, aug down in August and September. And annualized, the decline is now six point three percent. So that, given the two month decline, if you annualize it, if it happened at the same rate of decline occurred for the entire year, down six three. That's pretty. That's, that's nationwide. That's yeah. pretty meaningful, right? So. Yeah. And San Francisco like is getting crushed. Yeah, I think. Yeah, right. And that's September, by the way. We're, and um, so we're pretty proud to get that out very quickly. That, that was a good statistic. But I, I will just point out, SMP K Schiller doesn't. When I said nationwide, I meant the ten city at the twenty city average. Oh, okay. Because there is no there. Come on, yeah. You know, come on. Yeah, there is no nationwide okay. other than the twenty city average. All right. Everyone knows that, right, Chris? All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, you go. You you're next, Chris. What's your statistic? All right, I'm gonna have to go with um, negative yeah. 0.1 percent. Hmm. Statistic that came out this week. Negative 0.1 percent. Negative 0.1 percent came out this week. Is that a month on there, month figure? About, what's that? Is it a month on month figure? Month to month? No. Nope. Quarter to quarter. So how about uh, a little hint? It's a negative 0.1% or thereabouts. Thereabouts. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting hint. That's <laughs> got to have some meaning, deep meaning, the thereabouts, yeah. the thereabouts. Mark, you were going to ask a question. Might be negative 0.09. Right now, it might be. Oh, it's negative. a financial variable? Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh, it is. oh it's, it is the indeed. it's the it's the the 10-year Three month treasury spread. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Yeah, Inverted yeah. this week. Yeah. yeah. Very, Mark very Andy, good. Uh, that's a good one. Good, that's a good one. You've, you've you know, how does that, that, uh, that, but that doesn't influence your uh, recession odds at all. <laughs> hey, right? uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> they're no. lower. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're lower. <laughs> well, you know, we got this whole negative positive thing going. So, uh, okay. Yeah. All I, right. I'm still focused on that policy yield curve. 10 year versus well, funds rate. And that's going to be soon enough, right? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see, my friend. We'll see, my friend. Uh, <laughs> but that's a good one. So you're saying the 10 year treasury yield less the three month T bill turned negative. So the three month negative. bill yield, short term rates are now higher than long rates. And we, as we've discussed, uh, the inversion of the curve where short rates rise above long rates, that's a, that's a recession signal. Correct. Correct. Can so I now ask, we have two. The 10 2. And the ten-year, three-month. So, can I ask on that one? Um, how long uh, is the average lead uh, when it inverts to a recession actually occurring? Do you know? I mean, I know the ten-year, two years, like almost twelve to eighteen months. Twelve to eight, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I, you think it's I, that long? I think it's similar, but uh, oh, so that would mean no recession until end of next year or yeah, later. It, yeah, it, that's right. Yeah, not first half, but, but later in the year. Okay. That's a good one, but that's an average, right? I think. Yeah, no, happy. no, no. Yeah, there, there's. I'm sure there are cases where it's much shorter than that. Yeah. Uh, 
Hey, Mark, you're up. What, what, uh, do you do you, you want to play the game? I know, right? Well, um, I'm happy to play the game, although it appears I may have made one minor error. I did not realize that the data had to come out this week. No, 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 nope. no, no. For our no, guests. No, no. Okay. I violate that, that rule. rule I said apply. the best, the best. It doesn't have okay. to be the best. I violate okay. that all the time. Okay. So my, here's my number. And, and I have... I have no idea whether you'll think this is easy, impossible, or somewhere in between. Okay. Because I just don't know you all well enough. Um, but my number is eight hundred and ninety-three thousand. Uh, that's the number of multifamily units in the pipeline going to completion. That guy's good. Whoa. Wow, baby! And here's the, <laughs> oh, and, here's yeah. the and and here are the points about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and and no collusion, Mark. There was no collusion. Right? There was not. There okay, was not. no collusion. Absolutely not. Where's my, point where's about my cowbell on that? Hold yeah, on, wait, I, wait, you wait, got wait. it. I got it. Okay, all right. Go ahead, Mark. I was going to say, so the point is, that's an all-time high. Highest ever. Hmm. But to your point, uh, and Mark, you were bringing up the point that if we begin to see some of the supply chain disruptions ease, <laughs> some of that stuff will come back online. However, some of it is also because a greater share of new multifamily construction is high rise rather than garden. That's a trend that's been going on for some years now, and that takes longer to build. So more stuff will be in the pipeline longer as a natural uh, phenomenon because of that. So it's not as if it's gonna all come online really in a hurry and, and we'll, we'll just jack this up. I think we're just gonna see larger numbers, multifamily under construction, on an ongoing basis, but not necessarily this high. This this, this is, should this should moderate aligned with what you were saying, Mark. This is permits. Is this permits no, no, no. or this is starts? No, this is under construction, started they're, but okay. not completed. They're 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 in the pipeline. They've got a foundation or whatever, mm. and they're all, off and running. Um, you can mothball them, but boy, they not a multi. I don't think you can do that for maybe a single family, but not a multifamily. That well, the other thing is when it, for in the multifamily world, if you're building. You know, you're starting at high rise. Uh, once you start construction, you're still 18 months out from completion. So you're not going to stop it because there might be a recession yeah. in six months. Uh, right. You got to get this stuff right. built and you you just have to. And that's one difference between the industry today. And by today, I mean late 90s through the present. And before that, you have professional apartment owners. Th this is their business. They're not like going to disinvest and like go into something else if the if the industry goes into recession they have to manage through a recession and that's what they do and they'll still come out the other end so they're thinking longer term than just what the cycle is doing right now so and of course as you pointed out mark we we're undersupplied so okay yes you know uh, i know i know there's going to be uh you know once things normalize here a little bit on the demand side i got some people are going to scarf down these units because we don't have nearly enough yeah, exactly. Hey, I'm not going to give one because we're run, we're definitely running out of time, and and uh, I've got a hard stop in a couple of minutes. But I do want a lightning round. Uh, what is the probability of recession in the next twelve months? Ready, Marissa? Sixty percent. Sixty. Chris? Seventy. Seventy. Mark? Um, well, it's, it's either there will be or they won't be. So I'm going with fifty percent. Fifty. I'm mm. I'm with Mark. I'm going with Mark, and Mark knows what he's talking about. Fifty. <laughs> Five oh zero five zero, and, he's, and I'll just point out that the, the guys with gray hair in the case of Mark, no hair, Mark Zandy, no hair. Uh, you know, we're at the fifty, and these youngsters, uh, you know, although Chris is getting a little gray there so with his diamond study glasses. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, flip a coin. Yeah, All right, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're gonna we're gonna end this podcast that way. Uh, it's, written in granite now marissa 60 chris is at 70 mark o is at 50 and mark z is at 50 so that's uh we'll see how this all plays out and uh hey mark that was fantastic we i thought that was highly productive uh and i learned a lot and uh, i'm gonna follow that survey now very carefully i thank you for bringing that to my attention i don't know how i missed that in the past but that's a great survey so you're, thank you you're welcome and, and just for the we also have another survey we've only been doing for a shorter period of time i think a couple of years 
unfortunately, it's a similar name, but even longer, so you won't like it. Quarterly survey of I forget what it's called, construction stuff. Uh, but it has <laughs> lots stuff. of it, it has lots of it has lots of detail on precisely those kinds of questions oh. you're asking. What's this? Okay. Are there are supply shortage issues on certain things? What about the labor? Can you be able to get later? What if you what have you done when you can't get labor? What kinds of delays do you have? A lot of great information, easily to found on our website. But if you can't, let me know and I'll send you the URL. Yeah, we should uh, cover that on Economic View. It sounds like uh, something we should be covering. Okay, with that, we're going to call it a podcast. Uh, talk to you next week. Take care, everyone.